I'm with Brent Nagdegal from the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology. Now, Brent, what is the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology? Well, we're an institute that focuses on sharing Israel's biblical archaeology with as many people as possible. While this building that we're in recording this from is really new for us, we just had an opening here. We're a, an outfit that has a work that's gone back 60 or 70 years based on our excavations here in Jerusalem. And they're really making those excavations and the, the biblically significant discoveries of those, really showcasing them to as, as many people as we can, both in Israel and also around the world. And when was the Institute started? So the Institute as a building opened on September 4th. So just, you know, you're really, you're that first interview that we've done since. But the work itself of, of sponsoring excavations here in Jerusalem goes back to 1968. So we're going back over 50 years now. Mm. Uh, now it's called the Armstrong Institute. Who was Herbert W. Armstrong? He was a philanthropist and, and theologian and also an educator that was based mainly in the United States, but whose work spread around to Israel and other states as well. And his interest in, in Jerusalem you know, started back in 1968 with excavations of Professor Benjamin Mazar. He was the head of Hebrew University and one of the big founders of the state. He was awarded the first archaeology license in Israel in 1948. And Herbert Armstrong basically partnered with him mm -hmm. to go 50-50 with Hebrew University and fund some of the largest excavations uh, in Jerusalem. And we've kind of continued with that legacy. Wow. How important is archaeology? Well, that's a, that's a huge question. I think understanding the past is, is critical to understanding where human beings have been and uh, where we can go, learn the lessons from the past, of course, to make sure that the course of, course of now decision-making is, is good today. Mm. In terms of biblical archaeology, I think it has supreme importance for a lot of people around the world, not just Israelis. And the excavations we focus on are mainly focused on the biblical period. So we're trying to give life to the Bible in a way that puts the, the actual physical artifacts, associates them with biblical history. And, and that's what we find in, in Jerusalem repeatedly. We find excavation that's done in many ways it's in a scientific manner that is separate from the biblical text, and yet we find it very much correlating with the history we, we all read in the Bible. Are many of the finds proving that the Bible is correct? I think... That question is, is one that would get so many people into trouble trying to answer that because you, you are limited in what archaeology can do because, again, you're scraping off layers and what remains today wasn't, was there anciently. But, of course, a city is huge and you're only discovering a very scant amount of that city from an old time. However, there's, there's nothing that we've found in Jerusalem in our excavations in 50 years that would disprove anything in the Bible on the contrary, what we've found in our excavations is definite proof of biblical personalities, biblical individuals, whether it be some of the high officials during the time of Jeremiah the prophet. We found their seal impressions, mm. two seal impressions related to Jeremiah's people that captured Jeremiah during the time of Zedekiah. We found seal impressions, meaning just like a stamp signature, an ancient kind of middle-aged wax and impression with a ring. We found a couple of those of biblical people, first and last names, that no biblical denier, if you want to call it, would deny that these people are the same people as the people in the Bible. And, and even, the, I think, the greatest discovery that we made alongside Dr. E. Lotmazar was a seal impression belonging to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. That's what it says. And it was found in archaeological terms in the right context. So we were digging down all through these layers for the past 2,700 years. We get to a layer that dates to King Hezekiah's time, and it's inside that layer that we find King Hezekiah's signature. And so the dating matches perfectly to him. And again, I mean, the debate over whether the Bible is accurate or not will continue to rage, I'm, I'm sure, because with evidence or without evidence. Mm -hmm. However, here we are 2,700 years ago and in Jerusalem, and we're finding the king that the Bible says lived here. That must be exciting. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, most of our excavations or all of our excavations have happened here in Jerusalem. And repeatedly we find discoveries that match up with the biblical text. And so people might could get jealous of that or in some ways be like, well, how is it that it's possible that you keep on finding, you know, material remains and stuff from the biblical period or from biblical personalities? And my response is always, we're digging in Jerusalem. Yeah. 
And this is where a lot of the, the Bible story from the time of David onwards is set. And so biblical history played out in Jerusalem. You dig down low enough and, and you're going to find uh, discoveries from, again, the biblical people uh, that lived here in this spot. Mm. Uh, now, you also sponsor archaeological excavations in Jerusalem. Tell us a bit more about them. Where are you actually digging? So there's ancient Jerusalem is, if people are aware of Jerusalem geography, you've got the old city of Jerusalem. That's a city that existed, the walls of that city from Ottoman times. So they're about 500 years old. Most of the ancient part of Jerusalem, the period from the Bible, is is further south of those old cities in a place known today as the city of David. They've kind of re-given the ancient name to the, the Jerusalem as was given to it by David. He called the city the city of David when he conquered it. And so we're excavating this area that is south of the southern wall of the Temple Mount, the south of the Haram al-Sharif where Al-Aqsa Mosque is, about 60 meters south of that, just north of the city of David. And this is the, the royal ancient acropolis of biblical Jerusalem, where all the, the kings and the priests, very close to where they would have lived and worked and the prophets, it's right here uh, where we're excavating. What sort of things are you actually finding there in the city of David? So right here, just, just north of the city of David, just before you get to the southern wall of the Temple Mount, this is where we have found, going down deep enough, built on bedrock, massive construction from the time period of King Solomon, which is what you'd expect to find based on the Bible. It talks about Solomon building the city out from where David inhabited. So we're finding big city walls found going back to Elot Mazar's digs there, a gatehouse from that period, an entrance to biblical Jerusalem. And inside the buildings associated that, we find small finds, really small, small artifacts like these seal impressions. The Hezekiah seal impression was found there. Our latest excavation actually just completed three weeks ago. Uh, we were digging there with Professor Uzi Levener. He's the head of the Archaeology Institute at Hebrew University. And it was just a month-long excavation. And on that excavation, we were in the, the time period of Jesus from 2,000 years ago. And we uncovered the destruction layer of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And, and people will be very familiar with that when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, culminating the, the Great Revolt. And inside that destruction layer, we have massive stones that were fallen down from the building itself, burn, charcoal. And we found these really important coins, actually, that were in the destruction as well. These are coins that are called revolt coins. Specifically, they were from the fourth year of the revolt. This is the final year of the Jewish rebellion against the Romans. And they were minting coins all the way up to this time in Jerusalem. And so to find a coin that was minted that very year that Jerusalem was destroyed inside the destruction of Jerusalem, for us it was uh, amazing. And even for the, the director of the excavation, Professor Uzi Levener of, of Hebrew University, it was amazing for him. He's excavated for 20 years up in the Galilee region in the north. This was his first dig in Jerusalem. And for him to find the destruction of Jerusalem was amazing. And these coins really helped definite dating uh, provide definite dating of this destruction it was uh, it was electrifying for him as, as he called it do you go out and personally dig yourself and have you found anything yes yes i've uh, i've been digging in jerusalem since 2006 was my first season in the palace of david excavation with with elat mazar the late elat mazar I was just a regular volunteer back then student volunteer and and so i found everything from potsherds to pieces of glass, pieces of metal, arrowheads from the Babylonian attacks. I've found these seal impressions in the field as well. I haven't found somebody with a biblical name on it personally just yet, but hopefully, hopefully in the future something like that comes up. Is Jerusalem one of the best places in the world to live because of the archaeology that's here? Well, I, I think, I mean, when people in Israel ask me what I do, I say, I'm an archaeologist. Where do you live? Jerusalem. Oh, good. They're always finding something in Jerusalem. And, and indeed we are. I think if you're excavating in a place whose discovery is going to impact the most people in the world, I think you're talking about discoveries that are biblically significant discoveries. And so the real focal point, as I said, of, of the Bible and biblical history is here in Jerusalem. And so for, for me, yes, it's important to be digging here and, and it's important for the Armstrong Institute to continue work excavating Jerusalem rather than just other uh, important places in the world. But we would put excavations here as being paramount. Are there a lot of practical things that you need to do when you're excavating, like registering the, the exact area that you're at and making sure that you know where 
how far down that you've been digging and everything? Yeah, this is not treasure hunting. As archaeology might have been done 150 years ago, it's incredibly scientific. That puts extreme constraints on those that are digging to dig to a certain protocol to make sure that somebody else can read your publications of the discoveries and prove themselves from what you publish that what you found is in the correct layer. That's what's most important. It's not just about what you find, but the dating of what you find as well. So I could find a seal impression of Hezekiah from some period 2,000 years after Hezekiah lived, and it's not going to be given as much credibility as if you were carefully documenting every layer and where every single discovery was found, and you can date everything else around this discovery to Hezekiah's time. That adds a certain weight to every discovery that you make. And so this process is so laborious. <laughs> Archaeology, people have a lot of notions that it's similar to, you know, Indiana Jones or things like that. We have had some Indiana Jones moments. Oh, it's, it's, it's true. There, those things do come around, but not every day. Most of the time it's digging in the dirt, painfully registering everything that might have somewhat unimportant or seem unimportant, but really it's the wealth of discoveries and the careful registration of all of those seemingly unimportant artifacts that help you date a layer, the potsherds themselves that are found everywhere, the carbon samples, the little bits of ancient olive pits that you can send away for carbon dating. It's those unimportant discoveries by themselves that are carefully documented that make sure that when you find something very important that you have correct dating surrounding it. So yeah, it's, it's painful, I would say, the process and sometimes, oftentimes laborious. However, digging in ancient Jerusalem, I think, carries with it a, a vision and a, and a value with it that makes you, helps you get through those difficult days. So do you uh, dig the soil out and sift it somewhere else? Yeah, this is a, a great uh, development in archaeological method that's come around in the last 15 years, the process of, of sifting and wet sifting material that we dig. So most excavations previous to 2005 and six, you would dig an important layer and then sift the dirt just with a, with a normal sieve and then try and see what you can discover out of that. And then from 2005 onwards, a lot of excavations, they started to basically think, well, let's just spray this the, the remnants that we find in the dry sifting process with water and see what else we can find. It's, and what they found was it turned little bits of mud or little bits of stone, what they thought were little bits of mud and little bits of stone, into amazing artifacts, coins, these seal impressions I'm talking about. Mm. For example, when we excavated an area just below David's palace in 2007, we found, I think, two seal impressions with our eyeballs in the field as we're excavating. Now, through this process of sifting and wet sifting, we found another hundred. Wow. So, so would they have actually been lost if you hadn't have been doing yes, this process? Yes, exactly. And so... Uh, what we've seen over the past, I would say, 10 years is an explosion of small finds, these tiny discoveries that archaeologists in the previous 100 years missed. Mm. And so we are basically capturing absolutely every bit of information out of the dirt. And so now, all of a sudden, we have an influx of biblical personalities that have been found in the past 10 years based on this wet sifting process. And I think this bodes well, obviously, for the future as, uh, in excavation as well. Do you have any things that you found on display here at the Armstrong Institute? We're still getting there. Uh, we're working with the Israeli Antiquities Authority uh, right now to get some artifacts back. Basically, everything that you discover belongs to the state of Israel. You can't buy it. So it belongs to the state of Israel, and it goes through a process of publishing. And so you discover it, you take it to the university, you look at it in the, in the lab, and once you've published the discovery in a, in a journal of something, then it goes to the Israeli Antiquities Authority, and then the process is to loan it from them. So we haven't yet. We're in, we're in conversation with them. We have done a lot of exhibits or a couple of exhibits in our past where we did showcase the Hezekiah seal impression uh, back at a, one of our campuses in America. Mm -hmm. um, so we are used to doing this display of artifacts. And, and hopefully, if people visit, maybe in a couple of months, we'll have some, some of these artifacts to display, uh, to show them as well. Mm -hmm. Now, for anyone who's interested in archaeology, tell us a little bit about Let the Stone Speak Out. Yeah, so Let the Stone Speak is a, a magazine that's produced uh, six times a year by the Armstrong Institute. It's absolutely free. 
It's a print magazine. Of course, people can read it online at armstronginstitute.org, or they can request a free copy of themselves that will be sent to them wherever they are. This is a magazine that focuses on biblical archaeology. So it'll have articles based on biblical history, and highlighting the biblical periods, as well as what has been discovered, both, you know, recent excavations, like current news, current discoveries, more than just our excavations, but more broader archaeological discoveries that match the biblical period in Israel. And then going back, I would say, revisiting important biblically significant artifacts of the past. And so, again, if if anyone wants to receive a copy of this, armstronginstitute.org, you can go there and just scroll down. You'll see the magazine offered there for free and just sign up and, and we'll send you the next copy. Do you also do lectures on archaeology as well? That's our goal, for sure. Right now, we do have a a podcast or YouTube video that we put out that we're kind of just starting up. That's also called Let the Stone Speak. People can just type that into YouTube and they'll find that, where we have interviews with biblical scholars and biblical archaeologists and inside Israel, where we discuss in, in that medium with the newest biblical discoveries. So we definitely have that. And then in the future, as we look forward, I think we're going to have seminars here as well. And, and I think if people, we have an email as well that people can sign up for, we'll let people know about those seminars that we have. It must be exciting because you must know that there's lots more things to be discovered that you haven't actually discovered yet. Yeah, I think people are, you think of Jerusalem and it's one of the most heavily excavated sites in the world and maybe 5, 10% of the city, ancient city has been excavated. So we're basing a lot of information. If we're going to come out and be a naysayer against the Bible because a certain discovery has not been made yet, or we haven't found David's name somewhere yet in Jerusalem, or Solomon's name in Jerusalem, we are basing those massive assertions on little excavation so far. And so from what we have found, I think there's a preponderance of evidence that does shore up uh, people's belief in the biblical account. However, I mean, there's so much more to be discovered in the future. What's your prayer for the future of biblical archaeology? Well, we want to make sure, as I said at the start, that most people can, and people that are interested can make sure that they hear about it, that they know about it, that discoveries don't go, that go made or, or, or things that have made, but they don't go unheard. They need to be told. They need to be spoken about. I think that carries a message for people of, of not just supporting biblical history, but hope as well for, for the future. Um, and it's, it really does bring the, the biblical history and, and uh, what the prophets talked about to light. It, it shows that what they were doing, what the messages they were giving, they're based in fact. Uh, we find their existence uh, through archaeology. And so it's got a, a hopeful message to it as well. What's your website and Facebook page for people who'd like to know more? Everything can be accessed from our website, armstronginstitute.org. Again, on the site, we have access to our email that we will basically send you an email every time we have new content on the website. That means a new article featuring biblical archaeology. The email probably comes out two or three times per week. Of course, we're accessible on Facebook just by writing Armstrong Institute as well. But I think the email is probably the best way of making sure that you don't miss anything from us. Okay, Brent, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul.